Jesse, thank you so much for joining with me today. Absolutely. Very excited. So where do we begin with your testimony of coming out of the Bethel Supernatural School of Ministry? What changed your mind about learning to become a prophet? Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot there. Um, I mean, really what it came down to, just to start with that question, is it's kind of a death by a thousand cuts. And a lot of that was the prophecy in general. Um, the, the kind of like the deeper I went into it, the more red flags were raised. Um, and it wasn't just like a one prophecy thing. Um, part of it is a little part of that ties into my background. That is that I, I kind of grew up in the charismatic church. So Bethel wasn't new per se when I went there. It was just more of what I already knew. So I, I grew, I very much grew up in a charismatic church. I grew up in a world where that was what we did uh, with the prophecy, words of knowledge, all that fun stuff. Um, and that was from the age of like 10 or 11, all the way up until, you know, when I was 17 and I went to Bethel. Um, so getting to Bethel was really just kind of getting the, it's like going from like a fast food restaurant to a five-star restaurant. It was kind of getting the really high end version of that. So it was and a nat natural segue for you. Absolutely. It was kind of like, Hey, like I'm already doing this. And now you're telling me there's a school that makes you better at it. Like, sure. I'm in, let's do it. Um, so, so you were already doing prophecy before you went to Bethel. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very much part of our culture at our church, you know, and a part, we had people at our church that were very much part of that. And like, they went to the Lakeland revival, Lakeland outpouring in Florida that, that was 2007. And so they were coming back up from that. So it's like, we were already immersed in that revival culture. So, yeah. And so what changed your mind? What made you turn away from wanting to be a professional prophet? Well, I, I never saw my, I never really saw myself as a prophet per se. Um, I've actually always saw myself more as like a pastor or an apostle. If I were to pick a role, you know, during like the, the testing thing or like, what's your, what's your gifting prophecy. I never saw myself as a prophet, but part of the theology was that everyone could prophesy. So even though you're not a prophet per se, you still could prophesy. And so you know, that was part of it. Like you just, you'd go to the bathroom, you get a prophecy, you'd go get coffee, you get prophesied over. Like it was just, you just always got prophesied over. Um, and it was even cooler when it was like the big wig that was coming through and they called your name out and that was even better. But um, what, what got me to the point, one, one of the big things I mentioned just a little bit in one of the interviews I did with Andreas was that it was really when I started diving deeper into other cult, like uh, other cults <laughs> and I've all, cause I've always been fascinated by cults. Like I love, I love learning about Scientology. I don't know what it is. I just, I'm fascinated by it and just the human condition of, of, of able to accept things and take them for what they are and go as deep as L Ron Hubbard's writings. And like, yeah, I believe that I believe in Lord Zenu and all that stuff. It's like, how'd you get that far? And I think of that and I look at prophecy and I started like looking into first of Scientology and you're like, those people are crazy. There's no way they could, I could be that crazy. And then you start learning about like other cults and like, you know, Jim, Jim Jones and all that kind of fun stuff. And then at one point I started diving into Mormonism. I'm like, what do Mormons believe? Cause I always had Mormons visit me at, at believe it or not at Bethel and Reading. And I had a lot of elders that would come to my door and I'd prophesy over them <laughs> when they come to my door because <laughs> I thought I was doing them a favor. Um, and it, once we started, I started diving into Mormonism. It wasn't, that wasn't until I was like, it, I'm, at this point, I'm like 10, 15 years, like about 10 years out of Bethel, like 2017, 2018. And, um, uh, well, 2017. So I'm really starting to learn about the Mormon church and what they believe. It was when I found myself agreeing with the Mormon where I was like, uh oh, <laughs> that's not good. And that's kind of a big part of like what I'm going to do a whole video eventually on my channel of all the parallels between Mormonism and charismatic church, because there's a ton. And it, it was a lot of those parallels that really opened my eyes to a lot of stuff. So you knew Mormonism was a cult and yes. you related to it. So there, ipso facto, therefore, you realized you were in a cult. Kind of. I had to really take my time because for me, that was a big jump to make. Mm -hmm. to go straight to like, oh, I'm in a cult. I was like, no, 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 I'm not in a cult. And I still, to be honest with you, I still to this day struggle to call it that. I don't want to call it that. Like, I I don't know if it's just my time there was, I have a hard time calling it a cult. I do. I don't like to call it that, but I, I know what people do when I hear like, you know, you and Roseboro and, you know, Kozar say it. I'm like, they're right. But I, I have a hard time saying it still, to be honest with you. 
maybe it's so fresh still. Um, yeah, I understand. I mean, I was raised in a cult, Christian science, yes. and yes. yet it's yes. it's not the most natural t- label for me to put on Christian science. But when I look yeah. at the what Walter Martin talks about cults, yeah. you know, the, the charismatic leader, Mary yes. Baker Eddy, and yep. you've yep. got Bill Johnson. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you look at that and then there's absolute uh, obedient, obedience yeah. to the leaders rules, which are extra mm-hmm. biblical rules. Yep. You know, I was raised that you cannot drink coffee. You cannot go to yeah. a doctor. You cannot drink yeah. alcohol. And, and so the, the rigidity, the legalism was there. I'm sh- and was there legalism at Bethel? Not really. To be honest with you, I mean, they they did have their rules of like pretty standard stuff for like a Christian college. You know, you're not expecting, you know, don't go partying and go, don't go drinking and stuff. But there wasn't like, I couldn't give you hard and fast rules of like, mm-hmm. we had to sit down and like, if you did this, you're out. We didn't have that. We had like a, like, if I remember, there was like a code of ethics like that you were agreed to, but it's nothing outside of the ordinary. Um, the part that was really, that felt culty, I guess you could say. And like talking about how once I saw the parallels between Mormonism and, and the charismatic church and what that was, was it was when Durbin asked this guy, he was asking him, how would you tell someone that Jesus is real? I'm pretty sure was the question. And he was talking about like the Muslim believes Jesus and the, is the, 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 the um, Muslim believes in Jesus, but they all have different definitions of Jesus. And the guy talked about how, he has a real experience with Jesus. I'm like, yeah, that's it. Like I've had a real experience with Jesus. I have, and he called it, like, Mormons call it the burning in the bosom, that like feeling they have. And I'm like, yeah, I've had that too. Like I know that feeling. I know exactly what you're talking about. Mormons take what cares Max believe to the extreme. They just believe what cares Max believe with more conviction. And what I mean by that is they both believe in prophecy. They both believe in the modern day office of the prophets but Mormons actually believe that their prophet, what they say, because Mormons assign a person, the person assigned is voted and assigned as the head prophet. You, you've had Brigham Young and, you know, Joseph Smith, obviously the original one. And the guy they have currently, they believe is a prophet. And not only do they believe that he's a prophet, but everything this man preaches on a Sunday is considered scripture. Like they take it that far. Like it is actually scripture. Wow. So they just believe what Charismatics believe with more conviction because Charismatics believes there's prophets, but there's also the caveat of, oh, well, they can get it wrong, though. Sometimes you mess it up. Sometimes you don't nail it. And so that's that's their kind of out is they're they're out for false prophets. Does that make sense? Yeah, it it's does. Like, yeah. And so yeah. once I kind of made that parallel, it's like, well, I do believe the same thing a Mormon does in modern prophets, but how do I differ in that? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, man, well, they're just more convicted than I am. Like, because if someone prophesies over a Mormon, they're like, oh my gosh, this guy's a prophet. This is the voice of God. Do Mm -hmm. I carry that same weight when someone prophesies over me? And I didn't. I was like, well, I mean, I just think it's like they have a good unction in their heart. You know, maybe they think about it. And once I, once I realized that difference, that's when it was like, okay, I started really questioning things. And Mm -hmm. I, I went down that rabbit hole and that's eventually was the death by a thousand cuts that took me out of the charismatic camp. Praise the Lord. Praise yeah. the Lord. You didn't go into Mormonism from this too. <laughs> I know. Right. I mean, that would, that'd be a big leap. I don't know if I'd, yeah. I'd go that far. Yeah. But <laughs> okay. So it. how, how does the charismatic church in Bethel reconcile with Deuteronomy 18, which says that you can, that uh, someone who is a prophet yeah. cannot even make one false mm-hmm. prophecy or it's not from God. And then it's actually, it's a death penalty in the old yeah. Testament in Mosaic law. Yeah. So they, they have some, they have some old wineskin, new wineskin language they use a lot. So like how there's the old wineskin and the new wineskin or the old covenant and the new covenant. And also they, they kind of use the caveat of like of, of dietary laws, um, you know, actual laws, you know, cultural laws, what like they kind of use yeah. that language a lot of like which laws carry over. Mm-hmm. And they use some of the scripture that Paul talks about how you all may prophesy. Um, yeah. And they use some of the, I think it's in book of Joel, I believe talks about uh, young men will dream dreams and have visions, all that stuff. And they'll take some other scriptures and they basically piece it together. Excuse me. At the end, it's, you can prophesy and there are prophecy is for today. It is a modern thing to do. Uh, it's just the caveat is that you have to get better at it. You have to practice. And if we're going to be prophets, we have to practice it. And I mean, you do like you actually have sessions in in school where like you're in you're in class with Chris Valentin. We go through the prophetic training book that they have, 
with Chris page by page. And the things that you practice is, okay, your neighbor, you know, profit, like to get a word of knowledge per se. And then they kind of start with that where it's not severe things. Like you don't feel like you need the death penalty for something. If you're only trying to prophesy or get a word of knowledge as to what someone's bedroom was like as a kid, I shouldn't get the death penalty for that. If I get that wrong. And there's, there's like this consent where it's like, Hey, we're going to try doing this. It's not like, I'm like on, like no one asked me not to prophesy over them. Right. So there was act, like in class, it's okay. Your neighbor try to, and, I'm, and this is the kind of stuff I'll be going over when I have like my breaking Bethel episodes. We're going to go through like every single class of what, what like, I'm basically going to walk through the entire one through for third year, but you'd have something like where it'd be, um, okay, look to your neighbor and I'd tell them, you know, what was their bedroom like as a kid? Okay. And so you're like, okay, I see like a, I don't know, like a Power Rangers poster, blue blankets and like a Super Nintendo. And it's like, well, I didn't have a Super Nintendo. But I didn't have the Power Ranger poster in the blue blankets. And it's like, wow, you got that right. And like that was edification of getting prophecy right. Like that was actually the you, you you're doing good. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. which and, and, and you just rinse, wash, repeat, and keep doing that. Mm-hmm. And that was yeah. Well, I mean, this reminds me so much, Jesse, of because I taught psychic development classes. We called them angel readings for gosh, about 20 years before I was saved, before wow. I realized I was a heretic and a blasphemer. Yeah. Um, and we did the same thing. We would pair people up in these classes and we would say, um, tell the person what their kitchen looks like in the present time. No way. Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is if you were sitting with someone who's a certain age and you know what was popular in the eighties for kids, you yeah. know, you would know that that's what would probably be in a kid from the eighties yeah. bedroom, right? A little yeah. boy would have power rangers and such. And, yeah. and so the kitchen, of course, there's going to be eggs in the refrigerator. Oh, you fa- you're right. <laughs> you have eggs in, in, in the fridge. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of it is, is kind of body reading, but I think a lot of it too, I, I remember doing readings for people. I didn't call it prophecy, uh, but I would get accurate information and then yeah. inaccurate. And we would just focus on the accurate. And I know that a lot of people in the Bethel and charismatic camp, they try to say that Agabus got things wrong with Paul's arrest. And that yeah, therefore yeah. It's, it's given a pass in the new covenant. I would heard that. A lot. I've heard that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But if you look at it, Agabus was not incorrect. I mean, Paul did get arrested. And if you look at the details, you can reconcile them to Agabus's prophecy. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And it wasn't vague either. That's no. the thing. It's like it's always this, and like one of the things Bethel taught a lot with prophecy was their three rules was no dates, no mates, and no babies. <laughs> like that was kind of the, the 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 rule. Wow. Is you don't you don't you don't prophesy about dates, about specific dates or times. You don't prophesy mates, like someone who's gonna get married, and you don't prophesy about someone having a baby. It was like three big things that was a no-no to prophesy about. But then you think about like what's biblical prophecy look like? <laughs> Very specific dates. Yep very specific mates and very specific babies for the three things like the biblical prophecy was very specific about everything from jesus to to uh john the baptist to like when the dates of things are going to happen who's going to marry who like Mm -hmm. how do you find a wife they sent the servant to go find the Mm -hmm. wife and how Mm -hmm. they're going to find her and what they're going to like those are the exact three things that biblical prophets did find and did declare but those mm-hmm. are the three exact things they didn't want us talking about it's probably because if you got that stuff wrong it would show the error in your ways and and you talk about chris rosebarrow that was one of the biggest things that chris rosebarrow noted i never even thought about when he talks about how the biblical notion of using the lord's name in vain mm-hmm. and what that is like mm-hmm. what does it look like to use the lord's name in vain and i've always thought it's just a swearing doing that but he explained how like it's actually better explained with false prophecy how you assign a promise promise to the name of god that god did not assign to his own name and god's word and his name never returns void and so when you do a prophecy with his name involved and it doesn't come to pass you've you've assigned his name to a vain promise you've used his name in vain Mm -hmm. and that's where it really like that's what clicked for me when I really saw the severity of false prophecy, it's not just getting it wrong. It's that we're assigning the promise to the creator of the world that he didn't create, that he didn't promise. (laughs) And that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's like signing a check that you can't write. And that's what really clicked for me where like, that was the, 
kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back is when you talked about that. Mm-hmm. And really, yeah. and that was shortly after a lot of the wake up all the videos too, where I started diving into Chris Roseboro. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chris Roseboro's videos convicted me too when I was planning on becoming a Christian prophetess after being yeah. a what I thought was a Christian psychic for so many years. And, and yet so crazy. what also convicted me, and I don't know if this does something, I don't know if how Bethel reconciles this is that it's the Holy spirit who distributes gifts. It's not up to yeah. us to go buy the gifts. That would be like Simon the yeah. sorcerer, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, they, there is a, there is a bit of that. It's kind of like you can, you can't pick your gifts, but there's also like this weird, like, well, what do you think you are? So, I mean, the Bible talks about God choosing apostles and mm-hmm. and God choosing the prophets. And often mm-hmm. where they're, you know, like Jeremiah, where they're kicking and screaming and saying, no, I don't want to yeah. do this. I'm too young. Yeah. I, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, look at Moses. I have a speech impediment. I can't do yeah. this. Yeah. And so yeah. it's not people willingly signing up and and can I ask you, you were at Bethel for all the years. Is that right? Three or four years? Yeah, I, I did. I did first, second and third year. Um, okay. My third year, I interned at the studio called The Sound House, which is the at the time Bethel used them as their recording studio. So I helped with engineering on almost four different Bethel albums hmm. um, and was worked very closely with all their, their worship teams and like behind the stage, all that stuff. And then I let when I left Bethel. I left on a good note. I just moved up from Reading to Washington state and continue to be part of Bethel affiliated churches and stuff. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you went to Bethel supernatural ministry school Mm -hmm. for three years, 2008 to 2011. Okay. And may I ask how much that cost? Cause I've heard it's very expensive at the time. So at the time when I went, it was right before it was really big. So when I went, we were the last class to be in the first year sanctuary. So um before when i went first year students filled up the main sanctuary at bethel which the bethel's church isn't big people don't realize it's not a big church it's not a big building the main sanctuary holds like maybe 400 people which isn't very big like there's some in delaware out here there's some churches that are bigger than that um and then the second year students were in the fireside room which was maybe 100 some students and then third year was all the interns so then when i got from first year they then started renting out the the um reading civic center And they rented that and that can fit sit sit like a thousand some people, I think. And they started making first year a thousand some students. Um, So when I was there, my first year class was only about, I think my first year class was like 400 people, 350 people. And then second year, we had Twinview campus and that let us have like 300 second year students. But as far as cost goes, first year was like $3,000, I think, 3,500 bucks. And then second year is like 2,800 bucks. And then the third year is like $500 because you're interning. So it wasn't that expensive. I mean, that sounds like a like, lot of money to me. <laughs> well, I say not expensive. Like yeah. compared, I, I, don't, I don't make light of the money, but I say yeah. like when you look at other like colleges, like if you're doing yeah. like a Biola college Got it. or going to Elam or like some mm-hmm. other college, you're looking at like a fifteen twenty thousand dollar $20,000 a year. Right. So to have a school year of, ed- of education, mm-hmm. it's like, it's really not that not expensive. And so, so did you get a certificate at the end? Yeah. Yes. You get knighted. <laughs> you get knighted. Okay. And so what, did, what are you knighted as? I, I guess a night. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's like you, you get knighted. It's like a process. It's the idea of royalty. Their, their idea of supernatural royalty. So recognizing your identity. I got pictures of getting knighted and you get a little certificate. You graduated. Um, they can transfer as credits to some places like Simpson University at the time would accept it as some credits for college. Um, but that's about it. It's okay. not like. So yeah. it's, it's not like you, you have a certificate where, oh, I'm a certified prophet. Not, not really. No. I mean, like you could, Mm -hmm. there were times like if a lot of my alumni would like go to do ministry and they would get recognized as prophets by the leadership because they graduated Mm -hmm. and you have that in your pocket, I guess, like, cause you went to Bethel. So like, and honestly, when I, when I started moving to Washington state, people found out I was a three of Bethel alumni. It was like, you're a Bethel alumni. It's like, cause this is when Bethel was first blowing up. And so they were, you know, they're really getting big. And so people were tickled to death to have a Bethel alumni student. And so mm-hmm. it's kind of like being a comedian. We're like, you're a comedian. Make me laugh. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> on, de- like, on demand. Yeah. It's like you're a Bethel student. Heal my leg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> like it, it kind of comes with this weird, like, oh, because you went to Bethel, you know, do this, or you can teach me how to do this or impart this. And it's, you know, you kind of have to navigate that. So, yeah. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. 
Yeah, can't be. Um, one of the things I've heard about the Bethel students is they're sent out like missionaries and they're sent out be. to Reading and you're supposed to go out and kind of speak a word over people or impart healings, like you said. Could, were yeah, you involved like, with that? Kind of, yeah. So like there's a couple stages of that. So when you're in first year, you you have your one year mission trip and then you also have ministry trips. So a missions trip is the one thing you go on, which is like your big mission trip. It could be to Tijuana, Japan, Germany, wherever it may be. Um, and then you have ministry trips, which you go to in second year. And second year is when you get to go because you've, you've been certified in first year. You've gone through the classes. Now you get to travel with leadership. So I did two or three ministry trips with Steve Backland. He's kind of the big name it and claim it declaration guy at Bethel. Like just laugh at that kind of guy. Um, I did a couple of ministry trips with Chris Valentin. Uh, down down in like Southern California. So like, and that's like a group of like five students and you just travel with them. You, you'll travel with Chris and you'll get to hang out with them and spend more personal time, with, which is fun. It's really cool. Um, as a student, it was like, hey, sweet, I get to hang out with Chris. And um, you go and minister at churches so that when they come to speak, you're there as like the ministry team for them. Mm-hmm. So it, it makes sense for them as a, I mean, mm-hmm. as a church, I do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But then on your third year, you can either intern, everyone wants to intern at the school. That's the kind of like the cool position to get is on staff at school. Um, but you also can go as a minister to other churches that are Bethel affiliated churches that are part of the global legacy network, um, which Paul Man Warren at the time uh, handled. He's from the UK. I think he's back in the UK now, but his, uh, his son, Luke was one of the main video guys at Bethel. Um, but they, um, that's when you'd go to like, you'd go to live in Minnesota for a year and minister at a globe that you'd be like a youth pastor or part of an associate pastor, or just part of the team at a church that was a Bethel affiliated church. And it'd be your internship. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. And so you interned with the musicians mm-hmm. and with the sound house. It was the main, the main producer at the, at the, in Reading. Yeah. Okay. So that's very interesting because as you know, a lot of us have spoken out that Bethel music and Hillsong and Elevation is Mm -hmm. a fishing pole, a marketing fishing pole to draw Mm -hmm. people in to their church. And I can attest to this when I was first saved, Mm -hmm. my husband and I, we were on a trip to Australia anyway. So we went to Hillsong because, because of their music. That's what drew us to that church. What, what were your views of Bethel music then? versus what your views of Bethel music are now. So then as, as a musician, you know, guitar, I, I start off on saxophone. I do bass, guitar, electric vocals, all kinds of stuff. As a musician, I just love their music. I thought that it, it was cool seeing people want to do, cause the, the ongoing mantra is like Christian music sucks. <laughs> it's like, there's just <laughs> no good Christian music. And I, I, as a musician, I still agree. That's pretty true. It's very hard to find good original Christian and also theologically based Christian mm-hmm. music um, with an exception handful. Um, yeah. And so I felt like we I should, we should of, mention the handful real quick. So, well, I like, I like Shane and Shane a lot. I'll start okay. with them. That, that's okay. a really good one. Um, mm-hmm. uh, for a while. Um, I, gosh, I forget some of the names. Now there's a one hymn cover. I forget. There's another band. Ascend the Hill does some cool mm-hmm. actual um, modern hymn covers, which are really cool um page cxv1 i forget what they're called it's for maneuver for something else they do some really amazing hymn covers um those are some of those like, i think off the top mm-hmm. of my head okay um, and and i yeah. just want to plug my favorite is nathan clark george i just he i'll be check him out he sings the psalms and his voice is amazing yeah i, I could listen to him all me. day my my wife just found a band that does they just sing the psalms i forget mm-hmm. she showed to me yesterday it was pretty cool but but yeah, I'll have to say okay. it, it felt like at the time what I was doing was I was providing, I was helping create and build good Christian worship music. That's what it felt like. And okay. Felt so like you, I, you felt I, like you were yeah. on a mission. Yeah. I mean, like in a sense. Yeah. And also just as a musician, it was a cool outlet. So, uh, no, yeah. I, like at the time you're using like incredible gear, like 4,000, mm-hmm. 8,000 hour microphones and like awesome setups and you're making real quality audio and it was and it, it is good music it's well written i'm getting to be a part of the process watching them write helping them produce i'm running cables for like jesus culture consumed album i'm like running hundreds of feet of xlr cables micing stuff up um at one point brandon anderson's guitar pedal went out and i'm like going out in the middle of a mm-hmm. live session fixing his guitar pedal it's like <laughs> it's fun stuff like as an engineer it's really cool and then leaving it after all that, it was, I still love following what they put out. Now 
I just hear theologically empty songs, Mm -hmm. just like theologically dead songs for one. Um, And they're just just are really awful in in that sense. Like we touched on that with Kozar a little bit, like just like the You Make Me Brave over and over again, or just like some of the theology, some songs, like they just Mm -hmm. make no sense. Um, And also like, I mean, even at the church I'm at, the Mennonite church I go to, I had, a, I had a talk with uh, some of the guys that help lead worship there and they lead worship so humbly. It's like mm-hmm. a pitch, a tuning pitch yeah. and we sing out of the hymnal, like, right. and it's so refreshing for me. Now mm-hmm. they will do some modern stuff every now and then, but they're really good at selecting it. But we had a little conversation about like, how do you feel about elevation worship? Or how do you feel about, you know, Bethel? And I was like, listen, it's not my department and I'm not the one to tell you what songs to do, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I wouldn't lead them. Yeah. I was like, if, if you ask me to lead worship tomorrow, I would not do any of their songs mm-hmm. because I do see it now as a segue into that, a gateway into that. Yeah. And that it's, it very much is the stepping stone into Bethel. Yeah. And Holly Pivik does a great job in her book. She does. Yeah. You give Bethel royalties every time you play their songs. So it's not harmless. Yep. It's helping to build new mm-hmm. buildings for them. Yep. You know, my, my um, wheelhouse when I was a new age heretic was cards and I was uh, mm. the producer of what they call angel cards. Yeah. They were, you know, these cards that were divination cards. And until I read Deuteronomy yeah. 18. Yeah, I, I and read so, up on those. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was completely convicted by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord that these cards were evil. I've burned them, got rid of them. Please, if you're watching this and use them, get them mm-hmm. out of your house. They're demonic. They're not angel cards. They're demon cards. But I interviewed a woman who was a Bethel Supernatural Ministry School s- student who went on a mission to Australia mm-hmm. uh, with Ben Fitzgerald and his okay. mother, Jan, and she was doing cards, yeah. um, these Christ alignment cards as a part of evangelism. But she was given rules that she couldn't talk about Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit. They had to use euphemisms instead. And so it wasn't mm-hmm. sharing the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very odd. And they kept saying, it's yeah. not tarot, but it was divination. And so I wondered if you had any interactions mm-hmm. with maybe the cards or any of that kind of Christ alignment outreach. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, so not so much the, the Christ alignment part, but um, we would go minister at new age events. So uh, Mount Shasta was considered one is, is considered one of the seven holy mountains yeah. in California, in, in the world. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of new age activity in Reading because of that. And so we would go to like new age events. And that was very much the rules, very similar. Like that's not nothing new. The, the, the rule was don't talk about Jesus in particular. You wanted to try to um, like be sneaky about it mm-hmm. and, and, and get Holy Spirit and Jesus in there without doing it directly because you didn't want to get kicked out or offend anyone. So that's nothing new. And then Ben Fitzgerald was actually a revival group pastor in first year when I was in first year. Uh, and he's always been one of the very mystic people at Bethel. He's his sermons very much aligned with, he talks about a lot of the mystics and a lot of the old saints and how they talked with animals and all this kind of stuff. Like he's, that's always been his niche. He's kind of been the mystic, like kind of creep. I don't want to say creepy because he's actually a super nice guy. Um, He's very sweet. I've talked to him many, many times. He's a very nice guy, but he's, yeah, that's always been his slant. He always had a fascination with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we definitely did have those in interactions and they would have those things at like new age events and whatnot. Yeah. We'd go to prophesy over people, but it would be like fortune telling basically. Right. Yeah. No, um, before I was saved, I was very involved with the whole ascended master movement that came out of the Mount Shasta mm-hmm. area with the I am and St. Germain and everything. And, and so the new agers would think that mm-hmm. Jesus was one of many ascended masters and they would call him Yeshua which of course is his yes. Hebrew name, but they, they would avoid the name Jesus, but call him Sananda or Yeshua. And, 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 and it's mm. a false Jesus. It's not the real Jesus. It's their imaginary kind of teddy bear. You can do whatever you want, Jesus. And so when you were going to new age yeah. events, did you meet people who said, Oh yeah, I follow Jesus there. Yeah, that was the hard part. It's like, what do you do with that? Yeah. Because <laughs> now you're like, okay, so I guess you're saved already. And that was part of my problem of not knowing the real gospel. Yeah. It's like, if I really knew the real gospel and someone told me, oh, I know Jesus. Yeah. What Jesus do you know? Is it the real Jesus? Is it the false Christ or the real Christ? How do we define Christ? 
and actually have those nitpicking conversations of like, do you have a good, healthy, canonical understanding of Christ? Do you have an understanding of the hypostatic union? Do you actually know what a good definition of the Trinity is? Do you know the real Christ? But I couldn't have that conversation because sometimes at Bethel, you'd learn Christ in the version of like modalism or something like that. Yeah. And so you're like, you didn't have a good understanding of the Trinity even or of what the gospel was because the gospel was a very power focused gospel, not a message based gospel. What do you um, mean? So no, it would be, it'd be very hard to, to tell someone. Well, like, it'd be like, um, like the power based gospel would be like, I can prove to you that Jesus is God because I nailed a prophecy. I can prove to you that Jesus is real because your leg got healed. I can prove to you that Jesus is real because you got your mail read and I got a good word of knowledge, but a message based gospel is based on scripture. I could refer to the Trinity because in one part of scripture, Jesus raised himself, the spirit raised Jesus and God raised Jesus. Yeah. So that speaks to a Trinity. I can mm -hmm. speak on the hypostatic union of the canonical understanding of Christ and how he is the one true Christ versus like a Muslim who sees Christ as a prophet mm -hmm. or as a, a new age or sees him as an ascended one. And I can explain the severity of like, no, he's not just an ascended person in him and through him and for him are all things made and created and held together. He's not just some ascended person. He is God. Amen. And that difference that I couldn't explain that from Bethel. Mm -hmm. It was just, Hey, your leg got healed. See, Jesus is real. And they're like, yeah, Jesus is real. My leg got healed. And you're like, Oh, oh wow. shoot. <laughs> yeah. That's an important distinction. So at Bethel, how much Bible study was involved? And if there was, was it the passion so-called translation? So yeah, the, the passion wasn't really out then um, mm -hmm. in 2008, seven. Um, actually, Bill mainly reads out the new King James version. That's his preference of oh. choice. So I usually read out and Chris likes the new American standard. Actually, mm -hmm. Chris, Chris Valton typically reads out new American standard. Um, but there was Bible study, but it usually revolved around workbooks. So like we have Bill's workbook, like, or, or sorry, Chris's like supernatural ways of royalty, super, supernatural prophecy. Um, and then we, we, we did have like, a uh, we had some, it was James Hoffman's, I believe, uh, concordances. We used his, but it's very, very charismatic leaning commentary. Um, and then there was like a Bible study base, but it wasn't like, there wasn't like, Hey, this year, here's the, the list of books in the Bible we're going to read. It was kind of like a very much a topical read through of like, mm -hmm. okay, we're reading through this, this day, this, this day, because we're stuck, because we're studying X, Y, and Z, we're going to read these scriptures. It wasn't like, we're going to read through Romans. I remember, I, if I can remember, honestly, if I could tell you a time, I remember getting the signs specifically what to read. There's only one real time I can, <laughs> I can remember where, where Chris was like, Hey, I need you guys to read Romans five, six, and seven this month, this week. Mm. Other than that, it was mostly just with the workbooks that we had. Like we would read God's generals, uh, experiencing the father's embrace, uh, which was a Jack Frost book. Um, uh, Benny Hinn's good morning, Holy spirit. I had a stack right. of like books, like probably two feet high of like, you know, Benny Johnson's the happy intercessor, um, wasn't required reading, but everyone loved it. it was John Crowder's mm -hmm. the new mystics that was mm -hmm. there. We read that. Um, yeah. So yeah. Sorry. Not a really yeah, no. Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's why. So the gospel, as you understand it now, the real gospel that Jesus is God came to earth, fully God, fully man. And, and he suffered and died on the mm -hmm. cross to take the punishment that we all deserve mm -hmm. because we've all sinned. And then he died. And three mm -hmm. days later, he was raised from the dead. And he's now at the right hand of our father, God, the three in one co-equal, co-eternal Holy yes. Trinity. And he will return mm -hmm. again to judge us all. So mm -hmm. that gospel was never taught mm -hmm. or never imparted to others. Is that correct? It was kind of, it, it's kind of assumed like, because the way Bethel works, and this is kind of part of why I wanted to do the Breaking Bethel series. It's kind mm -hmm. of like, when you apply at Bethel, that's why the first episode I'm doing is all about application because like when you apply, they kind of ask the questions of like, you know, do you get the gospel? Like, do you know, are you a Christian? <laughs> like, you know, do you, do you operate in the gifts already or do you not? And so Bethel isn't supposed to be a training ground for the gospel. It's supposed to be a training ground for supernatural acts. That's what you have to understand. It's not a place where you go to 
learn the gospel. It's a place you go to learn how to walk in the supernatural abilities, like the, mm-hmm. the gifts of the spirit. That's the goal of Bethel. Like that's the goal of, because for them, if you can't do that, you're not preaching the full gospel. Bill's been quoted multiple times. I feel like a gospel without the power is, isn't the full gospel. And so that's, that's kind of like the idea is like, well, you already know the gospel, but the full gospel is the gospel with the gifts. Oh, so, oh, well, that's deeply troubling because as Paul said, if anyone preaches a different gospel, he shall be accursed. They say the different gospel is the gospel without the gifts. What are your thoughts now about Paul's writing about the spiritual gifts in modern times? I, I kind of call myself a cessationist light. Mm-hmm. So I don't believe in the gifts in the way of like, you're a modern day healer and you're a modern day prophet and you're a modern day apostle, like apostle. I don't believe or like, or, a, you know, insert gift here. I don't believe in the gifts in that way. I do believe you could pray for someone, they get healed. Yes. I do believe in his sovereignty, God could heal someone. Mm-hmm. Like, I do believe that. I don't believe that just because the person prayed for that. Now we know they have the gift of healing. So it's like, there's got to be that separation where it's, yes, there is. God can still in his sovereignty, do whatever he wants and he could heal someone. And maybe even prophecy could happen, but it would have to be with the biblical standards of prophecy. Like, I can't just say, if someone tells me they're a prophet, well, the burden proof is on them to show me that they've had prophecies that have been very specific and the biblical standards have come through. And obviously it hasn't happened yet. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not going to count it out, but I'm definitely not going to just like say, hey, you're good and you're a prophet mm-hmm. because I can't because mm-hmm. no one's met the biblical standards I've seen. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. It does. And I, and I agree with you. God can do anything. Um, of course, we all go to Hebrews 1. And in long ago, in mm-hmm. many ways, God spoke to us and our fathers through his prophets. But then when Jesus mm-hmm. came, he spoke through his son. So how do you yes. reconcile that with that there could be modern prophets? Yeah. And that, that's, and that, that's what, that's kind of what the keystone mm-hmm. I land on. It's like, mm-hmm. cause if I have a, I try, I, when I have conversations with charismatics or people that are still in that, I try to like in sales we call it a soft close yeah it's like i don't want to get the full commitment out of you but i want you i want you to get you under, at least find somewhere we can agree on and that's kind of where i land on it's like and, and that understanding of how jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy he's the fulfillment of the king he's the fulfillment of the judge that they wanted he's the fulfillment of the sacrifice that we need like in the prophecies and in those things he fulfills all that and so like he's the perfect king priest judge prophet sacrifice he's all those things that's why we don't need judges. We don't need kings. We don't need prophets. We don't need sacrifices and we don't need priests anymore. Like that idea of like, he is the, we are the royal priesthood now. So I, I agree with all of that. Um, I guess when I talk to Cares Max, like that's kind of where I try to find like, okay, like if you're going to say as a prophet, can we at least agree that he would have to meet the biblical standards? That's, um, that's very wise because the, the desire for prophecy is really that desire for secret wisdom, isn't it? Yeah, and that, that's a big part. One of the biggest things I think that charismatics struggle with when you tell them their theology is wrong is you're taking away the idea that they've built and the charismatic church has built of your personal Jesus, of your personal, intimate, one-on-one relationship with Jesus. Like this, I talk directly with God and speak with him. Does that make sense? Like it's this idea of like, I speak directly with God. I have this intimate relationship with God. I commune with him every day. And like, kind of like the Kenneth Copeland of like, oh yeah, father, I hear you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And it's like that, that thing is really hard to break people from. And to say like, Hey, that person you think that you're talking to this whole time (laughs) probably isn't Jesus and having them. And it's a hard thing to confront. Like it's, it's hard and it's, it's not easy. Like I still struggle with walking away with that and, and being like, Hey, like I can still commune with God in the sense of like, I can read the scripture and I can have a conviction land on me. Like the spirit can convict me that can still happen, but it's not going to look like the way the charismatic church today presents it and not slipping into that. Cause that's, I think that's the harder thing to walk away from is cause it all of a sudden the, the fear is that now you're stepping into a Christianity that has no relationship with God. 
And it's not that there's no relationship with God. It's just that it doesn't look like the way you thought it did. Um, and you have to understand that. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, as someone who calls out false prophets, I get called a legalist, uh, a Pharisee, that I go to a spiritually dead church. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently, a charismatic person said that I was committing the unforgivable sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit by calling out the charismatic movement. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with charges like that, Jesse? Yeah, I've... How do you deal with that? <laughs> um, I'm kind of coming across that already. Like, it's just kind of starting for me. So I'm I'm a little... I'm, I'm kind of a foot soldier in this. I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, what is, I mean, I've had, I've had a couple people unfriend me on Facebook already, um, you know, because they said I was misquoting Bill Johnson or that I was misrepresenting him or that I wasn't being fair. And I'm like, listen, I'm literally just quoting him. <laughs> like, I'm not twisting his words. I'm just quoting him. And if you're offended by that, that's on you. Like, I'm not, I'm not taking out of context. I'll give you more context. And so, and also it's like, <sighs> when people tell me I'm quenching the spirit or I'm blaspheming the spirit, my first thought is like, or like, for instance, with charismatics in my interview with Andreas, it, I talk about in there, how I went to the atheist camp for a while. And then I came back to Christianity. And one of the things, a lot of my charismatic friends were still more concerned about, they were more concerned the fact that I was reading some of John Calvin's work rather than the fact I came back from atheism. Like, think about that dynamic there. It's like, hold on, you're more concerned about how I am not an a about how I don't believe in the modern gifts of the spirit rather than me not being an atheist. Yeah. Like that's a that's a that's a big issue there. You that's know? a big leap. Yeah, it is. It's I like, get that I, too. I can still I, if you're charismatic, I would say, hey, at least you're like your foot's in the water. <laughs> I would celebrate something there. Yeah. But it's like, they were more concerned about that. Oh, yeah. You know? So when yeah. I think about like, how do you deal with that? It's like, well, I guess, I mean, you really just got to, I always, it's kind of like, you know, dispute the theology, not the person, because I, I don't want to burn bridges. And yeah. so I stick to the theology. And if we can keep the conversation on theology and just scripture, that's great. Mm -hmm. And if in that they, they get mad and they want to burn that bridge, that's on them. But I don't want to burn the bridge. I just want to talk about theology. But because their theology is so tied to a personal Jesus, it every attack on that becomes so personal. Does that make sense? It does. And that's why it's hard to separate that conversation without attacking their theology is attacking them personally. There's no separating it. That's so, really it's really good to know for apologetics and evangelism to be sensitive to that. It is. It's hard. And that's partially why a lot of the times you talk to Mormons, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's why, like, I, I, such a, I such have such a heart for the Mormons because I actually meet with Mormons like once a month. Oh. I, I have Mormons that like, I, I have three or four groups, like groups of mm -hmm. elders. I just, they want to meet. I'm like, yeah, let's talk. And I, it's, it's for me, it's a great way of practicing just presenting the gospel. Mm -hmm. But it, I also am able to minister to them so well because I can speak to what they're doing because a lot of what they believe just ties to the charismatics. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. Oh, good. Well, praise the Lord for using you and using your past for his glory yeah. like that. Absolutely. That's great. Well, Jesse, you've been a joy to talk with, such a blessing. I, I pray that this video brings glory to God and points people to study the Bible, study a solid yes. translation, and compare yes. everything to scripture like the Bereans. Yes, yes, 